Hello everyone, I am coming today with a special video for my channel. This is the first time I'm going to be sharing um, a new thinker that has uh, really impacted me over the last couple of years. This is Jordan B. Peterson. Um, many of you may be familiar with his work. He has gotten quite famous over the last couple of years uh, from his YouTube channel and his books and his lecture series. His thinking has been very impactful for me, and I think that uh, more people in the creative community should listen and understand the kind of things he's saying. So I have uh, taken a clip from this wonderful new lecture he has put out, and I have paired it up with this illustration that I was inspired to make based on a lot of the thinking and the ideas around Jordan, uh, what he's been doing with his lecture series and his biblical series and all that kind of stuff. So I hope you enjoy. Thank you. The Logos is the antithesis to the Luciferian presumption of dominance and power. And it's, it's harder to formulate, which is why we've been wrestling with it and are doing that tonight as well in this place where it's been wrestled with forever. It's harder to formulate. It's not unidimensional. It's the, it's the union of multiple virtues. And so it's a tricky thing to grip. And it's so tricky that we don't have it fully articulated. And we've approached it, I would say, through narrative. And one of the things I've come to realize about the biblical narrative, and this is what I'm writing my next book about, which is called We Who Wrestle With God. And I suppose this lecture is a pre, uh, per, preview of, that, of the ideas in that book. Um, we characterize that which must exist at the pinnacle of the hierarchy of attentional prioritization with the characterization of the divine in narrative. You might say, well, what's divine? Well, we could define it technically. Divine is that which is deepest. What's deepest? That which most other things depend on. That's a good definition of depth. A deep and profound piece of literature, Milton, is the foundation stone for many branches of literature. There's many literary products you can't understand without understanding Milton. And you can't understand Milton without understanding the biblical corpus, which is even deeper, and in that sense, more profound, given the metaphoric relationship between the idea of profundity and depth. And the, why is the biblical corpus deep? Well, it's an attempt to flesh out, using narrative characterization, the nature of the spirit that has to inhabit the highest place in the hierarchy of attentional and action priority. And so why would I say spirit? Well, because it's an embodied, it's something embodied. It's not a description of the world. It's a pattern you enact and embody. And so when you're called to God and the Logos through the biblical corpus, you're called to allow yourself to be possessed by the spirit that represents the union of awe-inspiring, imitatable virtues. And then you might say, well, what are those? And I can, I can walk through some of them just so you get a sense of this. I don't want to do it exhaustively. In the opening chapters of Genesis, which is where the idea of the Logos is highlighted above all else in some real sense, you have this notion that whatever God is, uses whatever the Logos is to extract habitable order from potential. And the tohu vabohu, that's the chaos, is a weird intermingling in the linguistic sense of chaotic possibility of the world per se, with confusion and psychological disorientation. And so it's an amalgam, that chaos. And it's, it's the chaos you feel when a plenitude of possibilities opens up in front of you, which is destabilizing and psychologically challenging, especially if the purview of possibility is beyond your ability to contend with. But you can see the massive possibility conjoined with a sense of anxiety. That's too much possibility. To bring order to that, you cast your attention upon it and you prioritize it and God imposes a benevolent order upon that chaotic possibility, extracts from that chaotic possibility the habitable order that is good. And the reason that the habitable order that's extracted is good is because God uses the logos, which is something like a combination of orientation towards the highest possible good, which you could think of as love, and truth, and one way of characterizing the imitatable manifestation of the Logos is that it's the nexus of love and truth. And I think it's truth embodied in love, or embedded in love, with love being superordinate. Um, 
But that's a partial description and it's disembodied and abstract in some sense and doesn't have the grip necessary to compel you to act, to imitate. And so what you see in the biblical corpus are continual representations of the spirit that must occupy the highest place in the hierarchy of imitable, mimicable action as a, 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 a pattern that possesses your perceptions and actions and calls you into the world. And so, for example, in the story of of uh, Adam and Eve, once Adam and Eve are thrown out of the garden because they become prematurely self-conscious and prideful in some real sense, God is presented as the spirit that you walk with when you walk unself-consciously in relationship to the highest in the garden. And that's actually an experiential reference, as you imagine you're having a particularly good day in a particularly beautiful garden, like the day we had today. It's like, are you closer to God? Well, the answer is experientially, well, yes, because you feel, you feel that your existence is imbued with a deep sense of appropriate significance. That's not a rational, secondarily derived argument. It's primary. It's a primary experience. And part of what the biblical corpus is trying to do is to lay out the nature of the spirit that inhabits you when you're oriented towards the highest possible good and to point out that that's phenomenological, it's experiential, it's existential, it's embodied. It's not a secondary overlay of the description of the nature of the world on the world. That's not what the biblical corpus is trying to do. So in the story of Cain and Abel, what's God? God is that which calls you to make the appropriate sacrifices and calls you on it when you don't. And try to escape that and see what happens. We know perfectly well, perfectly well, that that's a pathway to hell. And you might say, I don't believe in hell. And I would say, that means you don't know anything. Noah, what's, who is God or what is God in the story of Noah? The spirit that calls the wise to prepare in the face of crisis. Do you abide by that or not? Well, you do if you're wise and you do if you care about the people around you. Abraham, what's God? The spirit that calls the inappropriately luxuriating out to the terrible adventure of their life. And that then requires of them the highest possible sacrifice to obtain the highest possible goal. In Exodus, what's God? The spirit that lays tyranny to waste. The spirit that guides you through the desert of the soul. The spirit that orients you towards the promised land and abuse you with the enthusiasm that allows you to make your way out of the tyranny and through the desert. And so on. And each story is part of a circumambulation, a narrative circumambulation that's attempting to represent the union of virtues that could be embodied in perception and action that constitute the pinnacle of the pyramid. And that, by the way, pyramid, that's Mount Sinai. That's the proper hierarchical organization of society. That's the aesthetic model for the construction of the Ark of the Covenant. It's all of that simultaneously. It's the Egyptian pyramid with the gold cap. The question is, what's the cap? What's at the highest? Well, that is the mystery. What should be placed in the highest place? We already said, well, something better be, because if nothing's placed in the highest place, then there's nothing in the highest place. And what's the consequence of that? Well, to return to that theme, anomy, anxiety, overwhelming dread, psychological destabilization, and the absence of joy. And there is no escaping from that except by solving the problem. But it's worse than that because this hierarchy of perceptual prioritization unites us socially. So here we are in a theater, and we've seen many examples of theaters today, including the amphitheater, where it's a concentric circle that focuses everyone's attention on the same spectacle. Well, that's the definition of a culture, is that everyone's attention is focused on the same spectacle. And so the hierarchy of perceptual prioritization and action that unites you psychologically is also the same structure that unites us socially. 
And so that means the kingdom of God is within and without simultaneously in some most fundamental sense. And you might say, well, we don't need a superordinate ethic to unite us. And I would say, okay, then we're not united. And so what are we if we're not united? And the answer is, well, we're a house divided against itself. And what's the consequence of that? Everyone, that's the Hobbesian nightmare, right? That's not the noble savage, that's the Hobbesian nightmare. It's like, you and I, we cannot play together. We cannot focus our attention on the same point and cooperate and compete amicably, peacefully, productively, and generously towards that point. And that's not nothing. That's the death of God. That's the rise of nihilism. That's the emergence of a corrosive and destabilizing and deep cynicism. And it's the death of joy and enthusiasm. And so we might say, well, what do we have in the absence of God if God is the spirit that animates us to action and perception in relationship to the highest good? And the answer is we have the catastrophe of the death of God that Nietzsche referred to when he announced the death of God and said simultaneously that we were the murderer of all murderers and that we would never find the water to wash away the blood. And that is definitely the situation we're in now. And, and hopefully, hopefully, we'll all wake up enough at the individual level to play out that catastrophe of valuelessness within our own souls and render the judgment that's necessary upon each of us in ourselves by our own voluntary assent or we'll act out the failure to do that in the external world. And that's the decision as far as I can tell that in some real sense and maybe in a sense that's more real than ever before in the entire history of the world even though this battle has been playing out eternally. That's the choice that confronts us now. I learned from Carl Jung, he said after the Second World War and the rise of weapons of mass destruction, that the fundamental danger that confronts humanity is now psychological or spiritual, in part because we are so technologically powerful that we cannot possibly survive in the primitive ethical condition that still obtains, that our scientific and descriptive capacity has expanded immensely over the last 400 years to the point where we're a planetary force of creation and destruction, but our ethical endeavor has, to say the least, languished. And you might observe that children given dangerous tools die. And so we have these dangerous tools, and that means, as far as I can tell, that we better become the people that can wield them with wisdom. And that's going to mean, like it's always meant, a return to the source, right? A willingness to rescue the dead father from the belly of the beast, right? A willingness to make conscious the nature of our hierarchy of perceptual priority, let's say, and to understand that that's a reality that might be superordinate to what we normally and have been taught to view as reality itself. And that the biblical notion that in some sense the word is the precursor to being itself actually turns out to be true. And it's a terrifying idea because it means in some real sense, and I also believe this to be the case, and I think it's also reflective of the deep notion of the Logos, what that means is that in some cosmic sense, it's on you. And you know, we have this notion that human beings, men and women alike, are formulated in the image of God, in the image of the Logos. And we believe that. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's an axiom of our laws. It's an axiom of our constitutional system, certainly in a country like Britain or, or, or America, any of the Western democracies, and to a large degree, any country that can function at all. There's the presumption that each person is a locus of divine value. And you think, well, do you want to live in a society that assumes that? Or do you want to live in a society that doesn't? And then you might also ask, do you want to have friends that assume that of you? Or do you want to have friends that don't? And the same thing might apply to the people that you love in your actions towards them. How are you treating them if you treat them properly? And I can't see, even speaking merely psychologically, that you can love someone and not treat them in some most fundamental sense 
like they're a divine locus of value. I think those are the same thing. And you can quibble about the linguistic representation necessary to derive that conclusion, but have it your way. You're going to act out your decisions one way or another. You're going to learn in the world just exactly what attitude you should bring to bear if you want to elevate those around you and simultaneously do the same to yourself. And you will find that if you do that, to the degree you do that, you are treating each person as if they're a divine locus of value and responsibility. And that's a terrifying thing too, because I read something once, I don't remember who said it, that God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. And I read commentaries on that idea indirectly, obliquely, by Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn, Jung as well, perhaps above all else, stating that we are each a center of the world. We each have a cosmic role to play. And you can think about it this way, and this is a useful way to think about it. You have potential within you to match the potential that's without, let's say. And we all upbraid ourselves and call ourselves out on our failure to manifest that which was that which is within us. And so here's a proposition for you. The world is languishing to the degree that you are not all you could be. And that could really be the truth. And to the degree that we're made in the image of God and made in the image of Logos, and also the entity that has to undergo the tragic death that's represented by Christ, and maybe the encounter with hell that's part of the story of the resurrection, that's us. That's what we face. And so I'll conclude my discussion of the characterization of the spirit that occupies the pinnacle of the hierarchy of attentional priority with the story of the passion, which is the full embracing of the catastrophe of life. That's what it calls us to. And religious or not, one thing you might notice is that a good proportion of the entire planet has been obsessed with the figure of the crucifixion and the story of the passion for 2,000 years. And even as an unbeliever, whatever that means, you, you have to take that seriously. Now you can write it off as a delusion. Freud tried to do that and so did Marx, but you have to ask yourself, well, if it's a delusion, why didn't people pick just something happy to look at instead of something utterly dreadful? And I say utterly dreadful because, and this is the truth as far as I can tell, what the passion is, is a distillation of tragedy. So imagine that in order to contend with your life, you have to be willing to embrace its darkest elements. You might say, why? And I'd say, well, hey, the darkest elements are there and they're coming. And if you're not prepared, they're going to, it's going to be far worse than it has to be at minimum. And maybe it'll just lead to your destruction in ways that are worse than death. And that's a high probability. And so in order to live fully, you have to confront life fully. And that means you have to accept the unjust sacrifice of the innocent in some real sense. And that's you. And that's not even enough. You see, in the Christian passion, why is it the ultimate tragedy? Well, tragedy is undeserved catastrophe, let's say. Well, then you amplify the catastrophe. Youthful death, torturous death, death with foreknowledge, humiliating death, death at the hands of the mob, death as a consequence of betrayal, death in the, in the purview of your mother's vision, death despite your innocence, death despite your moral virtue, death despite the moral virtue that you have that everyone knows about and recognizes and still sentences you to death. Death at the hand of a tyrant. Death at the hand of a nihilist. And then that's not enough because in the cloud of myth that surrounds the characterization of the embodied Logos, and that's Christ, following the radical acceptance of death is the radical confrontation with hell. And that's the harrowing of hell. And the story there says, in order to open yourself up maximally to the possibilities of life, not only do you have to contend with the tragedy of your own innocent sacrifice and be on board with that fully or pay the price, but you have to confront the gates of hell itself. 
And you might say, well, what does that mean? And you know, our culture has been obsessed in principle since the end of the Second World War with what happened in Nazi Germany. And that's as good an example of hell as anything that could be presented to the corpus of unbelievers who disavow any recognition of hell. And if what happened in the Nazi death camps isn't enough hell for you, uh, then I would suggest that you update your prioritization of perception and value, because it was cert it's certainly enough hell to be convincing if you look at it thoroughly. You know, one of the things I tried to do when I studied the Holocaust and also the events in the Gulag was to put myself in the position not of the victim and certainly not of the heroic rescuer, but of the perpetrator. And with a bit of meditation, you can discover pretty damn rapidly that you could be a perfectly effective torturing Auschwitz camp guard. And that's a hell of a thing to contend with. And I would say in some real sense, that's worse than contending with death. And I would also say that if you don't do it, you cannot stop it. If you're unwilling to see the part of you, and that's a Luciferian part in the most fundamental sense, if you're unwilling to face that, to the degree that you're unwilling to face that, that's the spirit that possesses you. And in a world like our world, that is not something that we can continue to do and get away with it. So, we're all called together here at Ephesus, which is quite remarkable for us all to be here. And what are we called to do? Wake up. We have a moral burden to bear. And that's the adventure of our life. That's the other thing. So interesting about the Abrahamic story is that God calls Abraham out of his luxurious slumber and sends him into a catastrophe. Tyranny, starvation, war, brutal. But he has the adventure of his life. You might say, well, the, it's the adventure of your life that justifies the catastrophe of your life. It's not some simple-minded, juvenile hedonism or desire for comfort. That's all what we're built for. We're built for the adventure of our lives. And where do you find that? You find that in orienting yourself to the highest possible good in all ways and speaking the truth forthrightly along that pathway. Thank you very much.